are preparing the cemetery and getting the funds to take care of Clyde's grave, but Clyde is in heaven. Lord, we love you. And we thank you because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Because of your unconditional love, grace, and mercy toward us that you reached down and you have saved us. It's not because of anything that we've done. Paul said it's not of works because if it was, we would boast. The only thing that we can do is celebrate Jesus. And so, dear Lord, we love you. And Lord, if there's one here that has not done what Benjamin did a moment ago, they have not given their life to you, they've not followed in believers' baptism, then Lord, may they understand that one day they could miss that homecoming. We don't want that. We want them to come during the invitation or in children's church to come and to say, Bethany, I want to do what Benjamin did. I want to give my life to Jesus so that one day, dear Lord, the circle won't be a it won't be broken. And Lord, we love you. Forgive me where I fail you, where I let you down. Lord, let me be a tool in your hand. And may everything be for your glory and honor. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, you can remain standing. And I want you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 13 through 14. And Bethany, we appreciate you. And those that help her with children's ministry and are part of that is such a great thing. Benjamin is a classic example of a, of a child coming to Christ and people pouring into him. So we're excited about that. Take your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, beginning at verse 13 and 14. Everybody look this way while you, once you've found it. Uh, last night, Sheila and I got a call. It was from uh, Sheila's sister. Well, it was, no, it was actually a text from Sheila's niece, our niece. It said that Sheila's youngest sister had been attacked by the neighbor's dog. Um, her dog had actually wandered over into this yard. This dog is a pit bull mix. He, he was on a chain. He staked out in the front, and the, they got in a fight. And Sheila's younger sister, in an attempt to try to break up the fight, was attacked by the dog. Uh, 19 sutures, ripped leg, I mean, you know, lost a lot of blood, uh, was at the university, carried by ambulance. And so we were dealing with that last night. And, you know, I was thinking to myself, Caesar Milan says, the dog whisper, he says, never break up a dog fight. But the reality is, if you've ever loved a dog, you'd do whatever you had to do to protect it. And Tina was simply doing instinctively what would come. You know, the Bible says that a righteous man, a righteous woman, woman cares for their animals. Did you know that? You can tell a lot about a man or a woman and how they take care of the animals that have been entrusted. Teresa's is back there smiling real big because she's got a horse that <laughs> she actually she adopted just like you would go to the animal shelter and take a dog. She took a horse, <laughs> and uh, there's pictures all the time on Facebook of her and this horse and how this horse is just its life's been turned around because it's loved it's wanted and Tina did instinctively what came natural and I was thinking to myself at first I thought haven't you read Caesar Milan haven't you listened to the dog whisper never break up a dog fight and then it was like God just reminded me son that's what Jesus Christ did you were being ripped apart by the enemy you were held in the in the clutches of the enemy Jesus Christ went in he got bloodied but he saved you we ask about Tina's dog, and Tina doesn't weigh 110 pounds, maybe. We ask about the dog, and they say, well, the dog's kind of bloodied up a little bit, but he's just a wagging his tail, just as happy as no telling what, <laughs> you know. And so what a picture it is of, of how the Lord Jesus Christ loves us. You know, we looked last week at principles. I believe these are principles for a great life. Every parent looked this way. If you've got a child, these principles should be instilled into the life of your children. In other words, these are great principles of life. And so let's look at verse 13, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Paul said this, he said, be on your guard. There's one principle. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. Let's read that again. 
be on your guard there's one stand firm in the faith that's two be men of courage that's three be strong that's four do everything in love that's five that's five great principles for life well let's pray again Lord we love you and we thank you and we pray this in the name of Jesus amen amen you can be seated you know, last week we looked at this idea of being on your guard. Paul said, be alert, be watchful, be vigilant. The Bible talks about that all the way through. And, and last week we said technology, this right here, everybody look this way. This, this thing right here has gotten in, the, in fact, it's sending me, a, it's sending, Hibbit Sports has actually got a sale going on. It wanted me to know that right now during the middle of church. So let me clear that. But this thing here is interfering with life. And in many ways, we looked last week, we said technology, first of all, has distracted us. Secondly, technology has given us accessibility to sin and behaviors that we probably don't need to be involved in. Thirdly, we said that technology has interfered with our task. Technology keeps me from doing the Great Commission, keeps me from doing what God has called me to do. So we said last week this idea of be, being watchful, be vigilant, uh, be alert, is because we have a spiritual enemy. And that enemy, Satan, now everybody listen, that enemy is the enemy of that sweet little boy that went underwater a moment ago. Benjamin is probably one of the sweetest kids that I know. He's just got a sweet countenance, sweet spirit. He, he was looking at me. He was on the other side. I said, now, Benjamin, because the water was real low, I said, Benjamin, I need you to step down. Well, he had stepped down and he didn't get back up. I said, Benjamin, come down to the next step. Be good. I said, I said, Benjamin, I need you to go all the way down. And you could just see the little bit of fear in him, trepidation as he was, you know. And I'm talking him into getting down into the water so that I could see where the water was, is on his chest and be able to gauge in baptizing him. But let me tell you something. Benjamin has an enemy. And that enemy put a bullseye on his head, and that enemy is doing, going to do everything that he can to keep, listen, to keep Benjamin from achieving God's purpose and God's plan for his life. Hey, we don't know what we've got up there. We may have the President of the United States. I had a woman one time of, of uh, people there in Greenwood, Mississippi, and uh, Dr. Yeldell and his wife, he pastored North Greenwood Baptist Church. I believe that was a church. She made this statement one day. She said, I never knew that the boy who lived next door or backed up to her, our, our house, I never knew that that kid who would come over and eat at my table all the time, I had no idea that one day Bill Clinton would be the president of the United States. We never know. In fact, Bill Clinton gave the eulogy at Dr. Yeldell's funeral when he passed away. So the Bible says, be alert, be vigilant. And hey, listen, grandparent, parent, it is our responsibility, pastor, for me to be vigilant, watchful, and alert to be aware that he's got an enemy. I'm doing everything I can to help protect him. That's what I'm doing. Now, Paul goes on to say, watch what he says here in verse 13. He said, be on your guard, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith. In other words, he's saying, listen, you need to be settled, you need to be secure. You don't need to deter, you don't need to be frightened, you don't need to be intimidated. You need to stand firm in the faith. I wrote this down. Kids need to, kids, your children need to see you comfortable, secure, and not easily shaken by anything that comes along in life that would cause you to look as if you are uncertain or, or unstable in your faith. Let me tell you, there's one thing I love about Sheila. One thing I love about Sheila, and she's a strong person. Sometimes Sheila look at me, she says, God's got this. God's got this. You may have a child right now that's in rebellion, may be a prodigal. You may be dealing with finances. You may be in a relationship right now where things are not good. Let me tell you, if you are a child of God, God's got this. And you can say that. That's being settled in your faith. Sheila will often look at me and she'll say those words, God's got this. God's got this. And he does. That's what it means to be settled. 
One writer said this, Albert Barnes said this, he said it means be firm in holding and defending the truth of the gospel. Charles Hodge said this, listen to this parent. Charles Hodge said, we should not consider every point of doctrine an open question. Did, you, did, that, did that hit you like it hit me? Did that hit you like it hit me? Listen to that again. We should not consider every point of doctrine an open question. In other words, let me tell you, there are some things in this Bible that are settled. They're non-negotiables. They're not for you and I to converse. and. Hey, listen, there are some arguments, some debates I don't even get involved in. That's settled. That's settled. That's a non-negotiable. That's, what we, that's why we have systematic theology. There are certain things in this Bible. In other words, the Bible says this, without the shedding of blood, there's no redemption of sin. That's settled. Billy Graham was to speak. He, Billy Graham was an archaeology major. Billy Graham was an archaeology major. And, uh, and I need somebody. Where's Willie at? Is Willie outside? Willie, would you go cut the heater off on that unit? It's circulating that water. And when you get my age, it makes you want to go to the bathroom. Go cut that thing off because I'm listening to water dripping back there. I'm teasing a little bit, but when you get my age, it does affect you to a degree. There's some things that are settled in the Bible. Billy Graham was an anthropology major. He was going to speak at a, at a university, an academic center, a very high muckety-mucks. And so he knew they were going to be firing away at him. And they had asked him to speak to the department, archaeology department, the anthropology. He was an anthropology major. So he goes in and to speak, and before he goes to the question and answer, he said, let me ask you a question. He said, name one civilization that did not practice blood atonement. Nobody could answer. And he said, that the reason you can't is because programmed in by the creator into the heart of man is this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption, no forgiveness, no salvation, nothing. Programmed in us. Even pagan religion shed blood. It's just something about it. There's some things that, listen again what Hodge said, we should not consider every point of doctrine an open question. There's some things in our life that are settled. That's powerful. And I really want to go on with that, but I don't have time. So uh, let me read something Martin Luther said, and then we'll move on to the third one. Martin Luther said this. He said, the devil takes no holiday. You know, I, I, let me tell you what the devil did not do. The devil did not have a meeting last Monday in hell and say, guys, let's go get everybody's attention. I want all of you to take, take off. We're just going to rest today. We're going to take it easy. It's Memorial Day weekend. Got a long weekend. You guys just take it easy. Satan didn't do that. Martin Luther said that the great reformer, he said, the devil takes no holiday. He never rests. If beaten, now listen to this parent, if beaten, he rises again. If he cannot enter in front, he steals in the rear. If he cannot enter at the rear, he breaks through the roof or he enters by tunneling under the threshold. He labors until he gets into your home, your marriage, your parenting, and every sphere of your life. Martin Luther said he uses great cunning and many a plan. And when one miscarries, he has another at hand. He continues his attempt until he wins. Paul said, be firm in the faith. Be vigilant, be watchful, be alert. You've got an enemy. And the only thing that you can do against those fiery darts that the enemy's going to is the shield of what? What is it? The shield of what? shield of faith you know what the shield of faith is the shield of faith was from head to toe a solid shield that would completely cover a Roman soldier you remember in the gladiator when the gladiator when they were getting ready to go out into the Colosseum and the gladiator the Spaniard looked around and he said how many of you fought in war how many of you are warriors and some of them hard men begin to look I am I am I am and he said as one they knew exactly what that meant. 
That meant that when they got out there and the enemy was coming after them, they were to secure that shield and those shields would lock together. And you remember that scene as the enemy was coming, overpowering with, with, with chari chariots and charioteers and marksmen. And all of a sudden you saw those Roman soldiers lock those shields in faith, one attached to the other, and they got down holding those shields and the enemy could not get to them. My friend, parent, that's what you are. And that little boy up there, listen, he should be able to depend on this pastor to stand so firm in the faith that I'm like a shield that's watching over him. And let me tell you, I have the responsibility of being a part of his life and seeing him conformed into the image of Christ and being everything that God intends him to be. He is a tender gifted little boy that may one day be a pediatric cardiologist and God knows we need men and women in the medical field who once again have a heart we don't know Paul says he says be watchful be vigilant be alert you've got an enemy stand firm in the faith and then watch this be men of courage the King James version, version, and I love this, it says, act like men, be strong like men. Matthew Henry said this, he said, show yourself men in Christ by your steadfastness, by your sound judgment, by your firm resolution. He went on to say, Christians should be manly and firm in defending their faith. I wrote down here, raising boys and girls to be spiritually strong, resolute, purposeful, purposeful, determined, unwavering, marked by firm determination, bold, steady, firm, firm determination that adheres to a cause or a purpose. In other words, what Paul said, man up. I've raised two girls and two boys. And I can tell you this much, that girl right there, I know one thing, she's driven by integrity, and she is a radiation therapist, and if somebody were trying to get her to do something in any way that was immoral, unethical, that was not right, she would stand boldly. Now, let me tell you, there's no man, I don't believe, that could intimidate her. I want to say to you that parent young ladies, listen, sometimes we have to teach our girls to be strong, to be solid, to be determined. We live in a very unstable environment. In fact, I wrote this down. If men choose not to be the spiritual leader, then women must step up to the plate and recognize that they have a spiritual enemy. They, should, they have to come under the lordship and the leadership of Jesus Christ regardless of what their husband does. If your husband fails to be that spiritual leader, then man up. Man up. I used to tell my daughters all the time there was one thing that I wouldn't budge, I wouldn't give an inch. I would tell them all the time, I said, you get your education. You get your education. You get that degree. You get that education because one day you may be in a marriage. You may have children and there may come a day when that husband may run off. He may leave you or he may die and you need to have the ability to take care of yourself. Man up. Sometimes, you know, uh, talking about Benjamin, Amelia, Amelia led Benjamin to Christ. She came in my office a moment ago and she said, Brother Jeff, that sweet little innocent face. She said, Brother Jeff, can I go in there where my mom and Benjamin are? I said, Amelia, you sure can. Come here and I'll show you where to go. She led her brother to Christ. She led him through the sinner's prayer. But she's got that sweet, sweet, kind countenance but it's our responsibility to take that and mold it into a solid, firm woman of conviction that is not intimidated. I wrote down, this does not imply that a, that a good little girl growing up should be taught to be bullish or hardened or callous or cold, a cold female. 
She should be taught to be a resolute woman of God who cannot be bought, who refuses to flirt, and who will not flounder her reputation and her integrity with the world. She is graceful, but she is strong. And for every woman in this room who has sons, you should pray every day that your little boy finds such a woman. We, we live in a day... I was reading about Joan of Arc. Wow! Joan of Arc was a peasant girl who believed that she was acting under the divine guidance of God. Joan of Arc led the French army in a major victory at Orleans in 1429. She repulsed, the writer said, England's attempt to conquer France during the Hundred Year War. Saint because the Catholic Church gave her sainthood, St. Joan of Arc was captured by the English and their French collaborators. In other words, French spies betrayed her. She was captured by the English and by French spies. She was tried as a heretic. She was convicted. She was burned to death on May 30th, 1431. Listen to this, Mom and Dad. At the age of 19... At the age of 19, Joan of Arc led the army of France to a victory against the English. It was said after her death, she believed that she was acting, listen to this, under divine guidance. She became the greatest natural, national hero, uh, hero of her compatriots, and her achievement was a decis decisive factor in the later awakening of French national consciousness. Wow. Ladies, let me tell you, there was a time in a society and a time in this history when you better buckle down and you better pour into those girls. Dad, you pour into those daughters. Mom, you pour into those girl, girls. You make, them, you make them women of stature, of integrity, of dignity. You teach them the principles of Scripture and you, ne and you teach them never, you never cower down. You never be intimidated. You're a woman of God, act like it. I said, we don't know what Benjamin will be. We don't know with that timid little voice that came in there and said, Brother Jeff, can I go with my mama and Benjamin? We don't know if she'll be the president of the United States. And God knows we need godly leadership in this country. And that's not girls, it's boys too. Teach boys to be men. Some people say, well, how do you teach a boy to be a man? Expect it. Act like a man. Coach McLeod, Bell Haven's baseball field is named after him. Coach McLeod was a member of First Baptist Fan, and I preached there for a while during an interim period, and, and uh, he was a precious man, kind of a shorter man. Coach McLeod, he's like a legend, baseball legend. First time I went there to preach, I had my four kids with me, Legend Jeffrey. Coach McLeod walked up to him and introduced himself and shook their hand. And I'll never forget, he stopped and he said, Son, he said, look at me, put your shoulders back, get your eyes on my eyes, and give me a firm handshake. How to teach boys to be men? Expect it. One of the most powerful things you can say to a little boy growing up is this, take care of your mama. Take care of your mama. Sometimes it's hard to do. And let me tell you, I'm going to say a word to moms. Mom, you can ruin, you can ruin a boy becoming a man. Why? Because you can be overprotective. You can dote over, you can coddle, you can baby, you can spoil. A boy at some point needs somebody to look at him and say to him, you're a man, be a man. Sometimes moms can be overprotective. They dote over, they coddle. You know, there's a homeless man. If I were to say his name, every one of you would know him. I asked him one day in a conversation, this homeless man living on the street for years, I asked him this question. I said, let me ask you. I said, how did you get where you are? You know what his answer was? My mom spoiled me rotten. And then he smiled and he said, and I'm still spoiled. 
You know, Paul said this. He said, be men. I, I watched the movie. I don't know about the language in it. I was watching the TV version, but American Sniper. Anybody seen that movie? It's a story of a U.S. Navy SEALs man by the name of Chris Cowell. Chris Cowell was a Navy SEALs. I learned something. The average pay of, a, of Navy SEALs is over $70,000. Some of you young men, let me tell you, uh, they can make as much as 470 something thousand dollars a year. A Navy SEAL is probably one of the best soldiers on the earth. Chris Cowell was what they called the U.S. He, he, he's the record. In American history, he's the greatest sniper that ever was. He won, his longest shot was 2,100 yards. That's 1.2 miles. He shot and killed a man. There was a man 1.2 miles away with a, with a rocket launcher getting ready to hit a convoy. 1.2 miles away, Chris Cowell, this Navy SEALs, picked that man off with a single shot. When, they were, when he died, over 7,000 attended his funeral. It was held in the Cowboys Stadium. When they were carrying his casket to his grave site, literally it was lying down the interstate, lying down highways, people hanging over bridges, many of them clapping, waving flags, celebrating this great man. He died. How he died? He died at a firing range where a mom had asked her, uh, him to help with a tr her troubled son who had PTS and had a lot of problems and asked Chris Cow, would she take him under his wing and the boy turned and shot and killed him on the firing range and you may say well brother Jeff what does that have to do because to me that's the parent you know, I love the story, that old Indian brave story where that tribe, they would take a little boy when he was about to reach manhood, that, that rite of passage, and that's what we've lost in this country. We have a feminine man today. Often moms are raising their sons. Sons are angry and they're bitter. Sometimes it takes a man to bring that under control. But in this particular Indian tribe, they would take a, a boy when he reached that, that right of manhood and they would take him out in the middle of the woods and they would leave him. And they would leave him in a place in an opening out there in the middle of the woods. And it was dangerous. There were bear. There were wolves. There were all kinds of threats. And they drew a circle. And they put that little boy, they put that boy that was about to become a man and declared to be a brave in the, in, the, in the Indian army, they put him in the circle and he could not leave that circle no matter what. And the little boy would be in that circle and through the night he would be up, he would, he would pace around, he'd be scared to death, he would look like Benjamin did a moment ago, looking at that baptistry, and, and, and this little boy, much of the night fretting and worried, and finally, this little boy would drift off to sleep. Every dad, every mom, listen, because some of you moms are raising, you're doing the best you can by yourself. Let me tell you, when the little brave, when he woke up the next morning, and the dawn of light began to rise up and that little boy would wake up and he would begin, his eyes would begin to adjust to that early morning. They're standing through the night and man, it gives me. They're standing through the night was a dad with his, with his arrow and his bow ready to fire at any threat to the little boy in that circle. Let me tell you, you and I have a Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and every time sin tries to creep into our life, we have a Savior that loves us so much, He has weapons drawn. He has weapons drawn. I wrote this down, parent, be careful who your children's heroes are. Let me say that again. Parent, be careful who your children's heroes are. Because let me tell you now, hey, listen, Hollywood, sports, entertainment, they got all kinds of heroes. Most of our kids today wouldn't know a book if it fell and hit them on the head. Read the biography of Booker T. Washington. Read the autobiography of Martin Luther King Jr. when one night his life was being threatened and King got up and admitted he didn't get up, he had been up. And he walked in there and he looked at his wife and his four children laying there and he was getting death threats. 
And about 1 a.m. in the morning, Dr. King made him a pot of coffee. He said he sat and drank a pot of coffee. And every time I read what he wrote, as he sat there drinking that pot of coffee, watching over, protecting his family, I think to myself, that's a man. Paul said, be a man. Man up. Sons or daughters alike. But who are their heroes? I remember years ago, I got out of college, I got out of high school, and I got my first job at Piper Industries over here. It was a plastic plant, and I'll close in a few moments. And I'll never forget, man, I was so nervous. I was making boxes for these, and I'm, I'm a, I was a hard worker. And uh, so I, my dad got me this job. He said, this is a friend of mine. He's plant manager over there. He said he'll let you come and work this summer, build up some money for college. So it wasn't mom and dad give me money. I wasn't no scholarships. None. I was too dumb for that. <laughs> you know, so I'm making boxes. Let me tell you something. I had boxes stacked right there. Then people got to laugh, and they couldn't even see the machines. I had boxes put together. They were laughing, making fun of it. Well, I went into, I'll never forget, I went in. I went into the office, and I don't know why I'd been sent into the office, but I went into the office, and the plant manager was there with Ron Piper, who owned the company. And about the time I went in, and it was an African-American electrician by the name, his name was Moses, I believe, and they were in a conversation. I walked in because I had been told to go get something out of the office. When I walked in, I'll never forget these words. The plant manager looked at the owner of the company and he said, that boy's dad is the smartest man I've ever met. Man, I may have been making boxes, but I walked out of that office and you'd have thought I owned the company. Went to another place where plant was having an open house never forget it again Sheila and I had gone there dad had asked us Whitco Corporation we were at Whitco we were looking at one of these long big machines that just stretched all the way out to the parking lot it looked like and all of a sudden we were looking at mechanisms and all the families of all the employees were there and I'll never forget as I was standing there these people didn't know who I was a man looked at his little boy and he pointed over at my dad and he said, you see that man right there? He designed all of this. Who's your heroes? Dad? Dad? You ought to be a hero. Mom? You ought to be a hero. You can't, Mom, you can't be bald. There's nobody worth flirting, dad or mom. You just don't compromise. You don't care what the world offers. You're not interested. Why? Because they're watching. Rosa Parks, the mother of the freedom movement, the first lady of civil rights in her 40s, was told by a white man one day to get up and give his seat, give her seat. Rosa Park in her 40s, Dr. King said she was a precious Christian woman, refused to give that seat up. That little act resulted in her being arrested and being put in jail. She was in jail twice. But her legacy of the strength and the stamina that she exercised that day on a bus changed the course of the most powerful nation in the world. You never know. Paul said, act like men. Well, we've got to stop there, and we will. Man, there's so much more I wanted to say, but I'm not. But I want to close with an illustration. I really thought about doing a live stream on Facebook for this illustration. But I want to act it out. So, Sheila, I want you to come up here with me. For all, you know, people who watch this, they may not, 
my dad said he was in Walmart the other day and a girl came up to him and said I, I watch the services at Southside every week me and my husband so I just let people know this is my wife when, sit down here Sheila um, years ago and Marge you and Jerry will know this years ago and our older folks you remember you didn't have the harness seat belts in fact we can remember when you didn't have no seat belt right I mean, I remember we didn't have no seatbelt. We'd be doing 70 miles an hour with the windows down because you didn't have air conditioning. Dad would be mad and driving that old Ford Galaxy. And man, we'd be flying, passing people and everything else. And there wasn't a seatbelt. You know, we had laid down. We even laid up on the back dash. Uh, you know, this is how this, we had no seatbelts. Then eventually they came out with a thing that came across your lap, a lap belt. And you kind of put that on if you wanted to, but if you thought it wrinkled your outfit, you didn't wear it either. Everybody who, from those times, Janice McBride, you'll know what I'm talking about. Everybody from those times when you had your child sitting next to you and you hit your brakes, right? Right? Am I not right? James Dobson said that that's love. You know, when you're raising kids and you, you hit that brake, you're not worried about yourself. You don't care. You're trying to keep that child from going through the windshield, trying to stop that child's movement going forward. There comes a day, and everyone listen, you young people listen. Dobson says there comes a day, let's trade places, Sheila. There comes a day when your child is grown and mom is old and mom is decrepit and we'll just say that I'm representing mom and uh, we'll just say Sheila's the driver she's the child she's the adult child here okay I'm the old parent whether I'm a man or woman I'm the old parent my, my faculties are not good I don't see good anymore I want everybody to listen to me. I'm afraid. You don't know what it is to get old, but I feel it. And you find yourself being vulnerable. And you find yourself sometimes being afraid. And so you're the, you're the parent now, but you're old, and your child's taking you to the doctor, and you hit the brake. You see it. I know she's joking, but this is really critical. One day you're in the driver's seat. Your parent is old. And when you hit the brake, you reach over and do what your parent did for you so many times. That's love. Let's stand heads bowed and with eyes closed let's just pray our heavenly father we just come to you and lord we love you and we thank you that lord you love us we thank you that dear lord even as paul is closing out this letter he's writing to a church with all kinds of problems lord their drunkenness and sexual promiscuity and factions and division and arguing and Incest, Lord, there's just so many things in this church, and yet he calls them saints. Why? Because of the unconditional, undeserved mercy and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. They were not saved by their works. They were saved by their faith and trust in the finished work of Christ. But Paul's giving principles here. He's telling them, you have an enemy, and you've got to be watchful you've got to be alert because that enemy that enemy is very very dangerous to you even as a believer he's telling them you need to stand firm in the faith and those people that are under your authority that are children that are growing up they need to see that person who is watchful and vigilant who's looking at friendships watching Programs, uh, checking music. Uh, they, they're always involved. They're intentional. They, they want to know the heroes 
of their children. They're teaching their children to stand firm in the faith. And then Paul says, man up, act like men, be mature, grow up, be everything that God intended you to be. God, we pray today, I pray if there's a man or a woman, a boy or girl, who may be watching this program, may be watching later, may be seeing it on Facebook, may be watching through a live stream right now, uh, they've never given their heart, their life to you. I pray, dear Lord, today that they would repent of their sin, surrender their life, and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I pray for some in this room, they say, you know, Brother Jeff, I've done that, but I'm not living a life that brings him glory. I'm ashamed of how I've been living. But I felt the Lord tugging on my heart today and I want to rededicate. I want to recommit my life to Christ. I want to serve Him for what life I have left. For others, it may be to unite, be a part of this church, plant their life here. To say, I need a family, a faith family to help me. I feel all alone. It's hard. I need a team around me. Lord, whatever decision needs to be made, I pray today that people will make it. And that they do what Christ, you have you've have urged them in their heart to do. And we'll give you the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. May never be a moment like this moment. You come. You come.